Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you guys here today, and it's nice to have those that are watching along online with us. We have so many fun announcements, so if you'd like to follow along in your bulletin or I'll read them out, of course, we have our normal announcements. We have small group tonight at 530. Remember, no meal right now because of the COVID precautions. We have um, Explorers Bible Study meeting on Tuesday nights. That's going great. We have youth group on Wednesdays, 415 to 515. It's awesome. You know what? I love my youth group kids so much, and it's wonderful because as we're working through our curriculum, they're, they're growing so much in their faith, and they're talking to their families about it. So that just has my heart very overjoyed right now. Um, and then we have, again, the Cub Scouts are meeting, the Girl Scouts are meeting, and my very exciting news, next Sunday from 2 to 3 p.m. is our Trunk or Treat that we're doing. It is drive through style, but we are encouraging everyone to come decorate your car, come sit in a lawn chair, wear a costume, just wave at people as they drive through. Uh, I am taking donations for candy. I have quite a bit, so thank you to those of you that have given me some candy. And out there in the narthex, I have our two giveaway baskets. So to win those baskets, there will be a raffle ticket in the candy bags. That's how they'll win one of them. And then the second one, we are encouraging everyone to upload pictures of themselves or their family in Halloween costumes to our Facebook page. Then the public is going to vote on who has the best costume. And whoever wins that one will win our second basket. The baskets are awesome, check them out, and I've started the event on Facebook, so if you're on Facebook, feel free to share it, okay? Everyone is welcome to come. I want to have as many happy people here as we can. Masks are required, we will be social distancing, and we will be in the gravel parking lot out back, okay? So again, that is next Sunday, the 25th, from 2 to 3 p.m. Duh, Alicia. Uh-huh. It's Halloween. Masks are required. Yeah, it's Halloween. Masks are required, okay? Steve's right. <laughs> um, and then budgets were due on the 15th. We have a board meeting tomorrow night here at 630. And then to mark your calendar a little ahead, we have a congregational meeting in December on the 13th. December will be here before we know it. And Steve will put out a Zoom link for the board meeting if you cannot attend in person. That way you can still be active with us. Um, Jill did the Zoom last time, and it was great. It worked out very, very well. So if anyone is interested in using the Zoom link to attend our board meeting, let Steve or myself know, and we'll get you taken care of, okay? We have the Christmas shoe boxes also. Kim has those. She's going to be putting those together. Um, it's time to start getting together supplies to put inside of those shoe boxes. And as of right now, we are going to gather those back up on the 1st of November. So the due date for those is the beginning of November. Um, and if you have any questions about the Christmas shoe boxes, see Kim and she'll help you out, okay? Are there any other announcements that I have missed? Yes, Kim. Well, you didn't miss it, but Mom asked me to announce that today out at Christmas, right. the Hall of Fame of Sun Drive is from 11 to 2, and there will be free food activities for kids. Okay, so Jensen Woods, the Fall Family Fun Drive is 11 to 2 today out at Jensen Woods. They're serving a great lunch. You should wear a costume, have a good time. This is a fundraiser for them. Um, they will have their masks. They will be socially distanced. I know Jan was very excited about that event. So, hey, if you're bored after church, swing on out to Jensen Woods and get yourself some nice lunch, okay? Are there any other announcements before we move to prayers, joys, and concerns? Okay, with that, we'll go to prayers, joys, and concerns. Are there any out there today? Chris Post, he's having a report put mm -hmm. in to have her uh, to do di dialysis. So she, she comes with uh, Mike and Christy. Mike and Christy. Yeah, Mike and Christy's friend, Chris Post. Um, keep her in your prayer. She is having a dialysis port put in. Um, again, let's keep Gary Wilkerson in our prayers as he is in Springfield with COVID. Just keep his whole family in your prayers right now. I know that's rough on him, and I'm sure he is just going crazy being tied down right now because this is his busy time of year. 
So just keep those in our community that are sick or have family members that are sick. Just keep them all in our prayers, too. And Cindy has symptoms. And Cindy, is, and Cindy Wilkerson, Gary's wife, is having symptoms as well. So definitely just lift up the Wilkerson family. Are there any others out there today? Lisa, did you have one? Mom. Oh, yes. Yeah. Steve's mom. How is she doing? She's in the rehab unit uh, up Blessing Hospital, which... It's like a nursing home, so there's no visitors. Uh, but keep her in your prayers. She's motivated because she wants to come home, so she's going to be motivated on her rehab. All right, so Steve's mom is in the rehab unit over at Blessing, and she is trying to get through it to get home. So that's a good rehab unit, though, so she is in great hands, but we will definitely keep her in our prayers. And are there any others this morning? All right, with that, I will hand it over to Pastor Steve for our time of prayer. I forgot to do birthdays and anniversaries. Hang on. We're going to do that first. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I got it. We're okay. We have Ryan Johnson. His birthday is the 21st. And we did have Nicole Miller and Jared. Their anniversary was yesterday. So go ahead and send them a text. Or if you see them out, wish them a happy anniversary. And Carolyn Wart, her birthday was yesterday. And unless there's any others, I think that'll take us through to next week. Okay. Now, now it's your turn. Also want to keep Stephen Perry in your prayers. Uh, Robin called me last night that they needed to take him to the hospital. He was having a severe headache and um, some other things going on, but nothing came back on the CT scan, so keep Stephen in your prayers and Allison and the kids. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we lift up uh, Chris today as she gets ready for dialysis. Pray for success in the port. Pray for success in her doing that at home and being able to uh, stay off of uh, going to the hospital for dialysis. Pray for mom. We pray for the Wilkerson family. Lord, we just pray for healing. We need healing of all kinds in our nation and in, here in our home county and our city right now. Between COVID and the other things that are going on, we have people that are suffering, Lord, and we just ask that you would heal them in whatever manner that you would choose to do that in. We pray for Bill and Kim with the upcoming wedding, patience and uh, nerves be taken away because of that. Lord, we're thankful again for fall. We pray for our farmers to be safe, that they uh, can get the crops out safely and, and get them to market. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you give us, that during this harvest season, not only farmers should realize, but we should realize that everything that we have in life comes from you. Now we pray as our Father taught us to pray. Our Father, who it art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please stand and join me in our hymn of praise, Take My Life.
please remain standing for our call to worship. From the comfort of our homes and prosperous lives, we come hungry for a better world for all. In our society divided by power struggles and prejudice, we affirm the power of your healing love. With the honesty of our doubts and insecurities, we rejoice in your love for each of us, seeking your blessing to make us whole. You may be seated for our communion hymn. Please join with me in the prayer of confession responsively. Lord of forgiveness, hear now the confession of our sins. Our greed and our lust for power create enemies where we should find friends. We fail to offer comfort and aid to those who are afraid and beat down by the burdens of life. Forgive us, merciful one. Give us sight to see your eyes, that we may bring hope and peace to our world. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come to you today thankful, understanding that you have paid it all, that your body was beaten, your blood was shed, that we could be white as snow. We lift up to you, ask for your forgiveness. Thank you for your faith and your love for us. In your name we pray, amen.
So Halloween's coming up, right? And trick-or-treating is a lot different this year. So we're going to pretend this is last year when you could walk up and just take candy out of a bowl and it didn't matter, okay? So pretend there's no COVID relation to today's children's church message, okay? So, <laughs> oh, look, all this candy. Okay, I'm going to go do something. Candy this house had. What? Please take one only. Oh, look. Glad I brought my bag with me. Let's see. Take one. Ooh, Reese's, Mounds, Um and Joys. Well, there's one for me. One for my dad. He likes that kind. There's one for my mom. Oh, and I might as well get some for the neighbor kids too because God wants us to share with the neighbor kids. Oh, heck. It's COVID. Nobody's watching. Oh, all right. Let me check my candy. <gasps> Excuse me. Can Do you see... Please take only one. Oh, I took one. Oh, no. Was I all out already? Yeah. Oh, no. I have to get some more for the neighbor kids then. Did you see? Were there a bunch of kids that came before you? Oh, there were tons. There were tons. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, what kind did you take? Uh, Almond Joy. Oh, really? I love Almond Joy. Well, how much candy do you have? Have you been to a lot of houses Oh, yet? yeah. I've got a lot from a lot of different houses. Are, are you sure? Yeah. Because that... Looks yeah. suspiciously like the same amount I had in this bag. Really? I just have one bag. I, no, um, are you sure? You know, God wants us to be honest. God, didn't, you, God, didn't your sign say one bag only? No, sweetie. Please take only one. That means one piece of candy. But I didn't figure you'd miss it. I, I didn't, but we have to remember, God doesn't want us to fit. But I can't choose. I know you can't choose. It's so hard. But guess what? You have all these other houses to go to. And, and I don't have very much candy. I asked very nicely for someone to only take one. Yeah, okay. All right. Thank you so much. See, this is self-control. I don't think much of that. <laughs> there we go. See, God likes it when we tell the truth and do things right. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So, what we learned about last week, we learned about the walls of Jericho, right? They marched around the walls, and they blew their trumpets, and the walls fell down. And what did God tell them? Don't take any of the gold. Don't take any of the treasure. Don't take any of that, okay? Well, we are going to learn today about someone who couldn't control themselves. They coveted the things that they couldn't have. We are going to learn about self-control, where you only take what you're supposed to. Okay, are you ready for a super fun lesson today? All right, let's go learn about some self-control and how to not covet things that God tells us not to. Self-control. Hmm. As you can tell, that's not something I do real well with as far as the F-O-O-D subject is concerned, even though I try. But today we're going to talk about Joshua, the seventh chapter, and we're going to be starting with the first verse. And it says, but the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things for Achan and his son Carmi, the son of Zabadi, the son of Zerah, and the tribe of Judah took some of the devoted things in anger of the God burned against the people of Israel. Now, as Elisha said, they were supposed to what do what with the precious metals? They were supposed to give those to God. And so Akan, he's thinking, well, they won't miss a little bit. And so he takes some out. And we find out that God didn't like that at all. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which was near Bethav and east of Bethel, and said to them, go up and spy out the land. 
And the men went up and spied at Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not have all the people go up, but let about two or 3,000 men go up and attack Ai. Do not make the whole people toil there, for they are few. Remember, they have won battles by following God's instructions. But can you see the cockiness that's going on here? Oh, we don't need to send everybody. Don't make everybody toil. There isn't that many of those people. We don't need to send. We don't need to do what God's telling us to do. So about 3,000 men went up there from the people, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them at the, the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Can you imagine their faith now? They're expecting to conquer. God's promised this land and promised they're going to conquer the land, but here are our soldiers running from the people of Ai. So that would cause your confidence to wane a little bit right there if you were the Israelites, right? Maybe God's not with us anymore. And you can see they chased them back pretty far. I would say eyes of, if Bethel's there, then that means eyes about Meridosha or Mount Sterling. Chased them all the way back to Quincy. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell on the earth, his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening, he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. Now remember, when you have sinned, when you're against, going against what God wants you to do, they put ashes or dust on their heads. Why? Scripture says that we were formed from dust. This is to humble themselves before God. As they're kneeling before this ark, they are humbling by putting the dust on their heads, remembering that they came from dust. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to give us the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? What would that we had been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. Remember, this is the same kind of stuff they said in Exodus. What, did you bring us to the Red Sea to die? Did you bring us here to starve to death? Did you bring us here to thirst? Did you bring us here to be defeated? Oh Lord, what can I say when Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us, cut off our name from the earth, and we will do for your great and what we what will you do for your great name? So in other words, people are gonna hear that we got defeated and they're no longer gonna be afraid of us. Word's gonna get around. You know how that goes. Word's going to get around and spread. Because word had spread that God was behind them, correct? Remember back last week when we were talking about uh, the walls of Jericho and the people of Jericho? They had already heard back when the spies went in that God was behind these people and everything that God had done. So the reputation preceded them. Now it looks like another reputation is going to precede them. And that's one that they were run off. The Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed, transgressed my covenant that I have commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen it and lied and put them among their own belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Get up, consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourself for tomorrow. And thus says the Lord God of Israel, there are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before the enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought near by your tribes. And the tribe that the Lord takes by lot shall come near the clan. So in other words, they're going to cast lots. And whatever tribe was picked was going to be the guilty tribe. Remember, lots came into place, what? When Jesus was crucified over his garments. 
They gambled for that. I told the story this morning, 2x2 two two put out a CD. We put out several, but if you ever want to tear a Christian group apart, try to pick a picture out. Okay? We couldn't pick it out. In fact, we were as least unanimous as we've ever been. There were five of us doing this, and I think we had five different pictures. And so what did we do? We laid the pictures upside down. This would be casting lots. And we had the studio technician at the studio come in and pick one, blind. Well, I can tell you the will of God was with me because it was the picture that I had picked. But that's what they were doing. They cast the lot. Now, what happened after they cast the lot? Well, they were going to keep narrowing down from the tribe down to the clan, down to the family, down to the individual family until they found the guilty party. And when they had taken the devoted things shall be burned with fire and he and all that he has because he has transgressed and coveted the Lord and because he has done an outrageous thing in Israel. So Joshua rose up early in the morning, brought the tribes near the tribe of Judah was taken. So that's whose lot got taken. And he brought the near the clans of Judah and the clan of Zerahites was taken. That was the next step. And he brought near the clan of the Zerites man by man and Zebedee was taken. And he brought near his household man by man and Akan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zebdi, son of Zerah, and the tribe of Judah was taken. Then Joshua said to Akan, My son, give glory to the Lord of Israel and give praises to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. Did you ever do this as a parent or your parents ever do it to you? And say, okay, tell me what you've done. Did you ever have a sneaking suspicion that your parents already knew the answer? But what he's asking for here is for him to admit to what he's done. That's what we do when we confess our sins. We confess what we have done. It, it, I, I don't think it's proper in God's eyes for us to say, well, God, I've done a lot wrong, forgive me. No, I think he wants us to think about our sin and he wants us to confess our sin even though he already knows what that sin is. Why? Because it's a faith of action that we have, correct? And so part of that action is when I sin, I ask forgiveness for that sin. In my case, I have to do all of them that I can remember and say, Lord, forgive me because I can't remember all the stuff I've done wrong today. I have to add that on the end because I'm surely leaving something out. Do not hide it from me, he says. And Akan answered Joshua, truly I have sinned against the Lord, God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw the spoil of a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, then I coveted them and I took them and see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran into the tent, and behold, it was hidden in his tent and the silver underneath. And they took them out of the tent and brought them to Joshua. And all the people of Israel, they laid down before the Lord. So they went and they found it exactly where he said. He confessed where he put it. And Joshua and all of Israel with him took Akan and the son of Zerah and the silver and the cloak and the bar of gold and his sons and daughters, his oxen and donkeys and sheep and his tent and all that he had, and they brought them to the valley of Akar. And Joshua said, Why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. And they raised over them a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from the burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of this place shall be called the Valley of Alcor. So they killed everything. Everything that, he, everything that he had because of his sin was now tainted. 
And so not only his family, but his livestock were killed and stoned, and they left the pile of stones. Why? As a reminder of the bad that can happen when you're out of God's will. Now, why? Why, did, why was all of Israel affected by this? Why did it take out? Well, Corinthians tells us, how many of you heard the story that we are one body but many parts? So this is what Corinthians says, for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Understand, your body knows when your arm is hurting. You've had an injury. Your whole body knows, right? Well, when the body of Christ is hurting, everyone hurts. We've seen it. We've lost loved ones. And we hurt for that person, don't we? Even though it's not our relative, it's our family in Christ, a part of our body. And so we need to understand that, that as we hurt, the whole body hurts. Now, the Kant's steps were downward. It wasn't one single act. To understand, when I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 sheets. So you have to see it first, right? You know? With me, it used to be electronics. I saw that, saw that new phone. I saw it. That in itself is not a sin, right? We see lots of beauty in God's earth. That's not the sin. But then what happens next? He coveted. I covet that new phone. I covet that dress, the shoes, that car. And then what? We take the coveting. Boy, I really want it. You know, we get to leave a lot of stuff at coveting. Still a sin, but we haven't taken action yet, have we? You know, every time I see a 67 GTO on one of the Meacham shows, I have to admit, I covet having one of those cars. I don't covet the price that I saw going for some of those cars. If anyone has one that would like to give one to me, I'd more than happy take it from them. But what happens? You take that, and what did he do? He took it. So this is a step process. Nothing happens just on the spur of the moment. There you see it, you covet it, and you take it. That's where the sin happens is where you take action upon that. And Ak Akan did that. He saw it. He said it. He said, I saw it. I coveted. I took it. And what was going through his head? None of us have ever done this. Well, God won't miss a little bit. There's, look, how much is going in his coffers? We do this at church. Well, I won't. I know God wants me to give more, but I'm not going to give more because guess what? The church has got plenty of money. Guess what? It's not about how much money the church has. It's what God is calling you to do. Do you covet God more than you covet money? That's the question. We do that with lots of things. Oh, I won't go to church today, or oh, I won't do this, or I won't do that that we decide that God doesn't need our time, he doesn't need our presence, he doesn't need our money, he doesn't need us to be praying and doing things for other people. We can come up with excuses, oh, there's other people praying, I don't need to pray. You know what I find out? The more people pray, the more love that's being felt. James says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. You see who Joshua blamed early on in that scripture? He said, why, God, have you brought this on us? Why did you do it? But what does James say? You're not tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. God would have to be tempted to hurt you for him to do that, right? And he himself tempts 
no one. That is Satan. But each person is tempted when he is lured, enticed by his own desires. You see, you covet, you take. That's what James is saying here. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. That's where you get it. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So, many of us think, well, our faith is personal. It doesn't affect others. Hmm. I want you to think of it in this way. Your faith affects other salvation, faith walk, and perception of who God is. Hmm. God's plan for you may include someone else's salvation. How many of you, have, and I'm not going to ask for hands, have ever thought of it that way, that God's plan for you, what he's asking you to do, where he's asking you to go, may have an effect on someone else's salvation. In other words, you didn't go to something and maybe the person was there that you were supposed to talk to, that you were to have an effect on, and maybe they were going to make a decision for Christ based on that contact and future contacts with you. But if you never do it, then what happens? Usually God sends someone else later, but what happens is something happens between now and then. How many of you have regrets about family members who have passed that you didn't go see in the last waning moments? Or a friend? What if you saw the people that had been affected because and had not come to Christ because of your lack of doing what you're supposed to do? Wow. That makes it a little more personal, doesn't it? God's plan for you may be someone's encouragement or discouragement in their faith walk. Hmm. I'm, I'm going to talk to a lot of people at home right now. You, you're saying, well, I'm worshiping at home. I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, but where's the action in your faith? Do you understand that your mere presence at an event or being at church may be an encouragement or a discouragement for someone else. So in other words, somebody walks into church this morning and they say, well, even with social distancing, we could have our normal crowd here this morning, but it, it doesn't look like this church has faith anymore. Hmm. Now, I understand there's reasons for some people not to be here, and there are health reasons, and there are good reasons. But can you understand also that your presence can be an encouragement that your mere presence here can encourage somebody in their faith? Hmm. I can tell you that when Lois Irvin was here, Bill used to pick on her every week. And she'd be disappointed if Bill wasn't here to pick on her. Do you understand your presence? You've heard me say this before. John Rohr being sitting close to my wife in worship service and his wonderful voice was an encouragement to my wife. Some people, it's merely someone saying hello today and asking how they are being encouragement. We don't understand that we have a bigger effect on other people encouraging them or discouraging them than we think we do. We're not in a bubble in our faith. Our faith is not something that we keep to ourselves. Our faith is something that is reactive and it affects other people. Think about this in the church. The, the, and I'm going to say this church and the church as a whole. We can either be an encouragement or a discouragement to our communities. Let me ask you a question. What is our church doing? Are we an encouragement to the community around us? Do we look like a church that has the faith of God, that believes in God? Are we in that kind of encouragement? The next thing is God's plan for you may be someone else's perception of who God is. If someone were to walk in, 90% of the churches today, and I'm talking even outside of covid their perception is that people don't believe in God. Why? 
because we don't have anybody. You look at Mount Sterling and we could fill every church in this town and still have about 40% of the people left. Hmm. When people perceive that God's not important and that can happen from our things again. If we leave God out of things... They perceive God is not important. Part of our problem in this world right now is the world perceives we don't need God because godly people are not doing godly things. It's that simple. Wouldn't your perception be that? What about a baseball team that showed up and just kind of went through the motions? Now, we don't need to warm up. We'll just play the game. And they lost 50 games in a row. What would your perception be? You see, the church is losing ball games right now. The perception is, is that God is not important and that we've got to change that around. We have to make people believe that God is important in our lives, in each and every part of our lives, each and every day. Important enough to pray about. Important enough, God's so important, I need to pray before my meal. I want you to notice something. Go back and look. Joshua prayed before the battle of Jericho. Guess what Joshua didn't do before the battle of Ai? Didn't pray. Look at what the people said. God sent all of us across the river to fight this battle. Oh, look at how things went the last time. We don't need everybody. This is a walk in the park. And what was the perception of the people of I? Now it was, hey, these Israelites are defeated. Maybe God's not with them. Do you think people look at the church today and say, Christianity is not worth anything? Look how few people practice their faith. And look, is God really with them? That's a really good question, isn't it? But we need to understand that our faith, as personal as it is, has an effect on other people, has an effect on their salvation, their encouragement, discouragement, or the perception of who God is. Your actions do affect others, and sometimes for years down the road. Hmm. Let's just think about this battle. Now, if they had fought wholeheartedly when things got rough, they would have lost more than 36 men, don't you think? But as soon as they started seeing defeat, what did they do? They ran. But out of this, 36 people's lives were affected because they didn't follow what God asked them to do. So now 36 people have died. Now I want you to see the fingers off of that. 36 wives were widowed. So now you could be up as high as 72. 36 families no longer had a father. You see how that spreads? Us following God's action in our lives has an effect on everybody. It's because if we bring somebody to Christ, who were they supposed to bring to Christ? And who were they supposed to bring Christ? In a leadership thing we did a couple of years ago, they told us that a pastor should pour their self into, what was it, 30 people. You were there, weren't you, Bill? Bill or Kim was there. Pour yourselves into 30 people so that those people could pour themselves into 30 people, could pour themselves into 30 people. If somebody makes a decision not to pour themselves into people, no one comes to Christ. And I think that's kind of what we have in today's world. People need to learn that the actions do affect other people, so be careful what you say and do. It's not always just about you. Hmm. I talk a lot about having faith and how God's going to change your life if you allow him in to do it, but again, I need to take that further and say, how many people's are lives if you make the right decisions in your life? Think about it in this way, an encouragement or dis uh, discouragement and perception of God. Roll it all into one. 
if the church as a whole, when someone passed, did not do anything, that would be a discouragement, wouldn't it? Well, my church family apparently doesn't care. What do we do differently here? We do church, we do funeral meals. We do funeral meals for people we hardly know, right? Why? Because we want to be an encouragement. They, we want our perception of this church to be people that care about other people, that God then cares about them, that they know that not only do we care, that God cares. What about the family next door that they just lost their job? Have you talked to them and said you're praying for them and actually doing it and being an encouragement? And say, you know, would it be okay if we just put your name on our prayer list that we're praying for you? What does that do? That's an encouragement. But what happens when people lose their jobs and they're, and they're cocooned, they don't think anybody cares. They don't think God cares. So it's up to God's people to reach out to them. What about a family you know that's struggling, maybe during COVID, that they don't have a job? Well, you, one of the things you can do is tell them about our pantry, right? How about the one step further? By the way, I understand times are hard right now. Our church has a food pantry. By the way, I've got this grocery bag of food that I wanted to give you. How appreciative. How much of God would they see in that action? You see, it's not about us. And right now, the perception of God in this world is that he doesn't exist. So how do we change that? We change that by Christian people doing what Christians are supposed to do. Showing the love of Jesus Christ in any way that God calls us to do that. However he calls us to do that. We do that. We just don't take it that our life is going good. That we don't need to continue to do what God's asking us to do. Well, I've done as good as I want to do. I've got a good job. I've got a car. I'm paying my mortgage. I'm putting some money in the bank. It's okay. Oop, I'm okay. So the world's okay. No, the world's not okay. You know that God will bless you more abundantly when you serve him in lots of different ways. That means financially that he could bless you Guess what? If he's putting you into someone's life, that person may bless you as much as they bless you bless them. So my challenge to you today, if God's calling you to do something, do it. Be a blessing to someone. Understand that, that what he's asking you to do is not about your comfort level or your skill level or what it's about you. It's about someone else out here that you are to touch. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the blessing that you are in our lives. Help us to be doers of the word. Help us not to take your word and your blessings for granted, but understand that we're here for a reason, that we are to go and teach and baptize in your name. would ask you for our hymn of invitation, Be Thou My Vision. Guide, God, guide me. Be my eyesight. Show me where I'm to go. Would you please stand? Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. God be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my life. Be thou my wisdom and thou truth, true word. <coughs> Me and thou with me, Lord, thou my redeemer, thy call thou hast won. Thou in me dwelling, and I with thee one. Riches I eat not, nor men's empty praise. 
Lord God, help us not to be driven by greed through seeking money, success, power above you. Teach us to seek the kingdom of justice and compassion and place the love of God and people above money. Amen. Yep. Yeah, I forgot to tell you.